Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Boiler Basics 102, Combustion Basics. My name is Alan Silver. I am a national account manager with SEC Incorporated, and I will be your presenter today. Today, we're going to cover a few items of interest, including recommended tools for evaluating combustion and combustion efficiency and why. We'll cover some definitions and the relationship between excess air, excess oxygen, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. We'll cover burners and typical designs, as well as NOx and why we care about it. We'll talk about combustion efficiency and some things that can affect efficiency, as well as turndown and typical burner control systems. That being said, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this photo kind of gives you an idea of where we are today. So until fusion power is widely available, which is at least 100 years from now, we will continue to burn fossil fuels, such as natural gas, oil, and coal. So for the purpose of this basic combustion discussion, we're going to concentrate on natural gas. So one of the first questions a lot of folks tend to ask us is, how much natural gas does the United States have? Well, that's a good question. So I did a little research and found that according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the U.S. has about 2,829 trillion cubic feet of technically recoverable resources of dry natural gas in the United States. That might seem like a lot, but assuming we continue to produce about 3 trillion cubic feet a year as we do now, we have enough natural gas to last us about 94 years. And so most of us are, are going to be gone in 94 years. It's still important to understand some of the basics of burning fossil fuels today. Okay. So let you know, there are a lot of variables associated with the U.S. Energy Information Administration's estimates. So um, who knows? We might have 50 years. We may have 150 years. So we don't really know, but that's our best estimate today. So let's start with some recommended tools for you technicians and you combustion engineers out there in order to properly check combustion and to evaluate a customer's burner and boiler operation. And we'll start with um, the burner, boiler, and controls operating and maintenance manual. Some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today are general in nature. Every burner, every boiler, and every control system has an operating maintenance manual. Highly recommend that you have one and hopefully read it prior to showing up on the job site. It is important to know that every burner is different and every design is different. So understanding the nuances of a specific burner or piece of equipment is exceptionally important. Um, on the control side, typically if you call our technical support group, we will ask you right away if you have an operating manual with you. If not, we highly recommend that you do pick one up prior to going forward um, in your combustion analysis. Although the ORSAT gas analyzer from years gone by was an effective method of measuring CO, CO2, and O2 in the flue gas, modern portable electronic analyzers give real-time information and conduct routine calculations without the need for tables or calculators. This is a picture of an ORSAT, which you can actually still purchase today from several manufacturers. Um, simply Google it on the web and you will find some, uh, some folks that would be more than happy to sell you one. I, on the other hand, highly believe in electronic combustion analyzers. There are a number of manufacturers out there. Find a good one, standardize in your company, and um, you'll be a lot happier with, with those than with the old ORSAT. So, the portable electronic combustion analyzer, typically you want a minimum of O2 and CO, oxygen and carbon monoxide. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why those two are very important when evaluating combustion analysis. If you're in this business now, and you plan on being in this business going forward, Having NO and NO2, which are the two constituents of NOx that you hear a lot about, might be very well worth adding to your portable combustion electronic analyzer. SO2 sensors, stack temperature, ambient temperature sensors, and draft pressure sensor. 
very typical for a portable combustion analyzer today. A CO2 sensor can also be added, although many portable analyzers simply calculate CO2 based upon the fuel selected. Please calibrate as required prior to using. So often I go to job sites where I'm helping or training folks on how to use our control system and they'll pull a combustion analyzer out of the trunk or out of their truck that hasn't been calibrated in a year or longer. Please take care of that piece of equipment. It is your uh, lifeblood when it comes to combustion analysis and um, you should take care of that equipment and definitely calibrate it on a routine basis. In California, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of areas require that every analyzer be calibrated within 10 days of the combustion analysis. Other things that you should have, pressure gauges and or manometers. It is very important to measure and record fuel manifold pressures, furnace pressures, regulator inlet outlet pressures, pilot pressures, all kinds of pressures and temperatures when setting up a burner. This ensures that the design limitations on the burner and or the boiler are not exceeded. It is not uncommon to walk out in the field and see the furnace pressure on boilers exceeding manufacturer's maximum recommendation by as much as 50%. And that's not a good thing to have. So uh, having proper gauges or manometers whenever you're co uh, conducting combustion analysis is very important. Fuel flow meter. This is probably the best way to verify the BTU input. This could be a portable fuel flow meter or it can be a permanently installed fuel flow meter. But having a fuel flow meter, especially a mass flow meter, will enable you to have instantaneous readings and easily allow the technician to set up the burner to its design parameters with respect to input, as well as turndown, which we'll talk about a little later. And then have a laptop a tablet, commissioning report, a clipboard, something, something to record baseline data in order to review and evaluate burner operation now and in the future. It's very, very important. Commissioning reports, similar to this one, and every manufacturer will list a commissioning report in their operating manual, in their O&M manual. And, uh, and this is kind of like the, the birth certificate of the burner or the boiler. Okay. It's a record of when it took its first breath, just like a baby. So make sure you fill out and record typical data per the manufacturer's recommendation. Let's talk a little bit about definitions. Combustion. What is combustion? Well, if you look it up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it's a rapid chemical reaction of a fuel with oxygen that generates heat and light. And that's exactly what we're getting for. We want an exothermic reaction where heat is given off so that we can take that heat, that chemical produced heat and transfer it into water or some type of fluid, could be a thermal fluid, and, trans and then transfer that heat somewhere else where we're gonna use it. For instance, in a steam application, maybe we're gonna cook chicken nuggets and we wanna transfer some steam to the cooker and um, you know, for, for process applications. Stoichiometric combustion, the theoretical or ideal combustion process where all the fuel and all of the oxygen are consumed and none is left over. So this is the perfect ideal combustion, something which I have not yet in 41 years come across, but we reference it quite often in this industry. Let's talk about excess air. This is a percentage of air above the amount theoretically needed for complete combustion. In other words, we're going to have extra air or extra oxygen left over after the combustion process in the flue stack. And then I'm going to mention O2 reference. Since the solution to pollution is not dilution, as many people might think, um, the EPA requires us here in the United States to reference all of our constituents, specifically NOx, CO, and other hazardous air pollutants to a specific O2 value. Typically, we reference things to 3% O2 here in the United States. Um, there are some areas in, the, in Europe that have a 6% reference method as well. So in order to figure out what your actual corrected 
parts per million is. Very simple to do. You just take your measurement times 20.9%, which is a concentration of oxygen and air, minus your reference O2, which would be 3% in our case. Divide that by 20.9 minus your actual measured O2 value. Now, the nice thing about this is if you're using an electronic combustion analyzer, the combustion analyzer will typically do that mathematics for you. Continuing with definitions, carbon dioxide, odorless an odorless gas produced by burning carbon. The maximum concentration in the flue gas is determined by the carbon content of the fuel being burned. What we mean by that is that for natural gas, if you burn all the carbon that's in the, in the natural gas, you'll form 11.8% carbon dioxide with no O2 left over. Okay, propane has more carbon, so it produces 13.8%. Maximum theoretical, number two fuel oil has more, carbon so it's at 15.6 number six fuel oil coal and surprisingly a lot of people don't realize it but dry wood has more carbon content than any of the other fuels that are out there let's talk about carbon monoxide a carbon monoxide is a colorless and odorless gas produced by incomplete combustion of carbon it is also a national ambient air quality standard criteria pollutant I know that's a mouthful to say, but carbon monoxide has been determined by the Environmental Protection Agency as being a hazard to human health. As a result, they have a limit to it. They establish criteria. And if you do not meet the criteria for the ambient air in which you live in the area, you are considered a non-attainment area. Now, there are other hazardous air pollutants that, they, that fall under the National Air Quality Standard, including NOx including lead and some other items as well. So speaking of NOx, NOx is an oxide of nitrogen or the oxides of nitrogen. They're comprised mostly of NO and NO2. NO is the predominant form of NOx in combustion applications. It could be anywhere from 90 to 95%. NO2 typically you know, five to 10%, possibly less. Um, so that NOx is produced in the combustion process when burning natural gas, especially at high temperatures. We'll talk a little bit about thermal NOx as we go forward. Fuel-bound nitrogen in fuel oils can also contribute greatly to NOx. Natural gas, for instance, this can be estimated to have very little fuel-bound nitrogen, if any at all. NOx is also, specifically NO2, is a national ambient air quality standard criteria pollutant as well. We'll talk about why that is and why we really care. Okay. Before we get to the specifics, we're going to talk a little bit about the three T's of combustion. Many of you uh, have learned this in your basic 101 combustion classes when you first started in industry, but the time, temperature, and turbulence, those are really the, cre the critical T's that we want to discuss for proper, efficient combustion of the fuel. If we have all three of those in the proper amounts, we will get the maximum amount of energy released from the fuel during combustion. I'm going to show you a little video here of a recent installation and setup on natural gas. The combustion analysis here was approximately 3.3% excess O2 in the stack. There was zero CO produced and, um, and a an efficiency in excess of 86% with an economizer. So that view was a view from the front of the burner through the front sight port, not through the rear boiler sight port. Let's talk about time. When a fuel is burned, sufficient time must be provided for the fuel to burn completely. If allowed to only partially burn, there will be losses as unburnt fuel. If too much time is allowed, the burner may not be able to achieve the desired power output. 
temperature. If the temperature is not sufficiently high, the fuel will take longer to combust. This may result in a change in the power output. Low NOx burners, though, oftentimes take advantage of this principle to lower the flame temperature, thus reducing thermal NOx, by reintroducing exhaust gas into the combustion process. So they're basically taking an ice cube and dropping it into a cup of water, increasing the mass, and reducing the temperature. This lower temperature inhibits the chemical reaction between nitrogen and oxygen, which is called thermal NOx. Thus, we reduce the amount of NOx produced, thermal NOx produced, in the burner combustion process. Then we have turbulence. Thorough mixing of the air and fuel is necessary to achieve proper combustion. If this is not done, there may be partial combustion, which can result in increased emissions or reduced power output. Proper mixing, proper turbulence, is really the mixing energy that we want to talk about in a little bit. And um, before we get to that, let me just gen give you some general information about combustion will occur when fossil fuels like natural gas, diesel fuel, gasoline, coal, et cetera, react with oxygen that exists in the air and will result in the release of heat. Obviously, we need a spark to get that reaction going, but once it becomes um, self-sustaining, we'll, we'll typically produce heat based upon the carbon content of each individual fuel. Knowing that air is 20.9% oxygen and about 78% nitrogen, we know that we're going to be getting nitrogen and oxygen in a flame, and that's where a lot of the NOx is produced at those high flame temperatures. The fossil fuels are generally described as hydrocarbons. Why are they hydrocarbons? Well, they're primarily made of hydrogen and carbon. Pretty straightforward. The result of reacting with oxygen is the production of water vapor and carbon dioxide. Since natural gas is primarily made up of methane, which is a carbon and four hydrogen, and when it reacts with oxygen, it can be described in the following formula. Okay, so here we have one methane reacting with two oxygen, creating one carbon dioxide and two water plus heat. Okay, there's our, our perfect combustion again. Nothing left over, all the carbon's consumed, heat's produced, carbon dioxide and water vapor are the products. So a typical boiler with a gas burner, in this case, would input 10 parts of air. Again, there's about eight nitrogen and two oxygen. And then we're gonna put in one part of natural gas, which has one carbon and four hydrogen. And coming out the stack, we should have 11 parts of flue gas, one CO2, two water, and eight nitrogen. Well, these calculations can be done via molar equivalence formula. Again, big picture is carbon, X, one part carbon, two parts oxygen, produce one part CO2, and two parts water vapor. So what is perfect combustion? We spoke about that earlier when we, when we defined stoichiometric. That is basically a condition where a mix of fuel and oxygen are each consumed 100% in the process. There's nothing left over, no carbon monoxide, no oxygen. This is the stoichiometric combustion that we talked about earlier. No CO2 is produced, no CO, carbon monoxide is produced, and CO2 is present in this case at its highest point. Complete, complete combustion is something we're probably more familiar with. This is what we want to have happen out in the field. In that case, we actually have a mix of fuel and oxygen where there is more than 100% of the oxygen required to burn the fuel. This is also known as excess air combustion or fuel lean combustion. Acceptable amounts of CO can be produced and CO2 percent begins to lower as the O2 and excess air percent goes up. Okay. This is the safe side of our stoichiometric mix. Let's talk about incomplete combustion. Here again, we add fuel and air. But unfortunately, in this case, this is a mix of fuel and oxygen where there is less than 100% of the oxygen required, also known as fuel-rich combustion. Rising amounts of carbon monoxide are produced as oxygen deficiency increases. Also, the CO2% 
lowers as well as the oxygen deficiency increases. So CO2 percentage will lower as oxygen deficiency increases, but it also will lower as excess air increases. We'll talk a little bit about that in the following diagram. This is our dangerous, this is the dangerous side of our stoichiometric mix. It's not where we want to be. We don't want to be in a place where we have unburned fuel creating carbon monoxide, soot, and, and other reactions. Oxygen can be present in the exhaust, even when we don't have enough. And that's typically when we have poor mixing, um, where the oxygen just never had a chance to combine with either any carbon molecule at all. So let's take a look at a typical combustion diagram. In this combustion diagram, we're going to designate the stoichiometric point or the perfect combustion with this dotted line. On the left-hand side of the graph, we have flue gas composition and percentage. And at the bottom side in the x-axis, we've got excess fuel to the left side of the stoichiometric mix and excess air on the right side. As we defined earlier, when we have stoichiometric combustion, perfect combustion, we've consumed all the oxygen. There's no oxygen left at the stoichiometric point. In the excess air side, we do have extra oxygen. And it goes up in accordance with the amount of excess air we're adding. Now let's take a look and see what happens to our CO2 and our carbon monoxide. As we said earlier, the stoichiometric point, this carbon dioxide, is it's at the maximum point. We have consumed all the carbon, we have consumed all the oxygen. So there's no way for the carbon dioxide to get any higher specific to the fuel. So all this point here will depend on if you're burning gas or oil, or wood, or any other carbon-based fuel. Now, as we go fuel-rich, excess fuel, we start to produce more carbon monoxide because we run out of oxygen. So instead of making CO2, CO2 percentage starts to drop, carbon monoxide starts to increase as it drops. Now, typically the ideal operating range for a burner is gonna be somewhere slightly to the right side of the stoichiometric combustion. We know already that we have no perfect mixing burners out there. Um, I wish we did, but we'll admit one and make a billion dollars. Otherwise, we're gonna use what we have today. The neat thing is in this ideal operating range is typically where we find our highest combustion efficiencies in this range. Do note that the CO2 curve, if I drew a straight line from one point across the stoichiometric line to the other, I would actually run into a condition where I have the same CO2 measurement on both the excess air side of the curve and on the excess fuel side of the curve. So as a result, we wanna make sure that we do not rely on monitoring CO2 only for combustion analysis, as you can get the same reading, either fuel rich or fuel lean. Very basics of combustion. If testing CO2, also test for CO, since fuel rich combustion will result in rising carbon monoxide levels. The best thing to do is to measure oxygen and carbon monoxide at the same time. Having O2 and CO2 in the flue can be an indication of poor mixing again. Turn down is too low for the burner, for instance. Also, you could have flame impingement on the side of the furnace, causing the flame temperature to drop too rapidly. I don't have enough time and temperature for the fuel to burn because I'm hitting a cold heat transfer surface. As a result, I make carbon monoxide. You could also have a damaged burner head um, or a whole number of different things that can cause O2 and CO to uh, be produced at the same time. So having that measurement in your combustion analyzer is very important. So the ideal operating range, just to let you know, the ideal setting for a burner is gonna vary based upon the design of the burner. Um, that's why it's very important to be trained in the operation and maintenance of that burner, as well as understand the settings that need to be made to the diffuser or to the head of the burner to give you proper combustion. Typically, an excess air percentage of around 16 to 30%, which equates to 3% to 5% excess oxygen throughout the firing range of the burner, will result in peak efficiency. This helps to ensure that changing conditions do not move combustion to the fuel-rich side. For instance, combustion air temperature, density variations during changes in seasons or even changes in hours of the day. 
But what is a burner, really? Everybody, a lot of people ask, what's a burner? What's the best burner? Well, let's just talk about what a burner is. And it's really just a device that is used to properly mix fuel and air for the purpose of igniting and burning the fuel to produce heat. Very simple. It's a blender. You want to blend the oxygen and the fuel so that each oxygen molecule comes as close to its own carbon molecule as possible so that we can produce a chemical reaction and release heat. And release heat. There is no perfect burner or mixture that I can conduct, although I did find a Osterizer blender that made a really good margarita. I thought that it was probably one of the best mixers I ever had. But uh, as far as burners go, well, we typically don't have stoichiometric combustion of fuel in any burner out there. Therefore, excess air or oxygen is always required to burn fuel completely. And since air is free, that's that's okay. However, burners that maximize, or in this case, minimize the amount of excess air or oxygen required to completely burn the fuel, can save fuel by reducing the mass of flue gases generated and increasing the temperature. Lower mass results in slower velocities through the boiler and longer contact time between the hot gases and the boiler heat exchanger surfaces. So it's, it's the more excess air I add, if I add too much excess air, I'm going to increase the velocity. I'm not going to give the gases, the combustion, hot combustion gases, time to release their heat into the water or to the thermal fluid or whatever you're heating on the other side. So burners that minimize the amount of excess air can help you save fuel. Let's talk about some burner designs. We'll only talk about two or three of these just for time constraints. Um, and it's, we'll talk about a typical nozzle mix burner, where the burner head is designed to properly mix the fuel and the air before combustion. The velocity of the mix is affected by the gap between the diffuser and where the fuel and air are introduced, right? So a gap that is too large can affect turbulence, especially at reduced firing rates where airflow is at a lower velocity. Okay. So let's look at a typical nozzle mix burner with fixed position diffuser or head arrangement. So the diffuser itself is gonna be stationary throughout the entire firing range. From the left side here, we've got our airflow coming to the diffuser, and in front of the diffuser, we're gonna inject our fuel. So that in this area, we're gonna have our turbulent mix between air and fuel, and we will burn the fuel at that point. So mixing energy. Again, it's just like taking a blender from trap A down to grind, you know, you increase the speed of the, of the little blender wheel in there, which adds energy and gives you a better mix. Same thing happens here in a diffuser arrangement. As we increase the airflow, we'll increase the P1 or the pressure drop P1 minus P2 across the diffuser. Airflow increases, mixing energy increases. Okay, so as firing rate is lowered, so is the airflow, and thus P1 minus P2, or your pressure drop across the diffuser also drops. This results in lower mixing energy. So as a result, this type of burner may require higher excess air or oxygen levels at lower firing rates to ensure that the mixing energy is great enough to ensure complete combustion, okay? Let's look at one other design of a nozzle mix burner. In this case, the diffuser is going to be adjustable. We still have our airflow coming from left to right, our fuel flow being injected in front of the diffuser. But in this case, in order to maintain a constant pressure drop across the diffuser, we're going to allow the diffuser head to move forward and backward. By doing so, we're basically going to choke off airflow and make the airflow go through the diffuser instead of around the diffuser. And this results in more of the air flowing through the diffuser at lower firing rates, thus maintaining the mixing energy. The mixing energy is proportional to that pressure drop across the diffuser head. So as I lower my firing rate, okay, the diffuser is going to move or the head will move forward. And as I increase the firing rate, I, I take the burner head, I move it backwards, just vice versa from where it is. Okay, this design has been around. In, in Europe for quite some time. We're seeing more and more of these here in the United States. And um, 
It worked very well. I've seen these burners operate different manufacturers, uh, 3% O2 throughout the whole firing range, in, in which case, in some cases, there's over 10 to 1. So let's talk about some premix burners. Okay, so premix is basically means that I am mixing the air and the fuel before I ignite it. So instead of nozzle mix, where I'm mixing it in front of the diffuser, I'm actually mixing this air fuel in a combustible mixture before I ignite it. In this case, um, in a, a mesh type material, uh, could be made out of ceramic, could be made out of other types of stainless steel, different types of materials. And, and then this gas mixture is burned on the surface. Um, and as, in doing so, I actually spread the heat release over a much larger area and I help reduce my NOx as a result. So premix burners mix the fuel and air prior to being ignited. The fuel to air ratios are normally determined by the level of NOx that is allowed. The excess O2 may be as high as eight or nine percent though throughout the entire firing range of the burner, which is quite high compared to, to some other types of burners. So now that we talked about NOx a little bit, why do we even care about NOx? Well, nitrogen dioxide, again, as we said earlier, it is a national ambient air quality standard criteria pollutant. And breathing air with high concentrations can irritate your airways and the human respiratory system. Okay, such exposures over short periods can aggravate respiratory diseases like um, asthma. Longer exposures can actually cause you to develop asthma and potentially increase your susceptibility to respiratory infections. I don't know if they're gonna put COVID-19 on the list, but um, nitrogen dioxide has been on for a while. Let's continue. Nitrogen oxides can react to form smog and acid rain. California has the most stringent NOx requirements here in the United States, in some areas as low as 2.5 parts per million. Um, due to the geographics of the area in the Central Valley in California, um, nitrogen oxides do react and form smog and, and can form acid rain. Um, can also react with ammonia, moisture, and other compounds to form nitric acid, vapor, and other particles. All right. The impacts of NOx on human health include damage to the lung tissue, breathing, and respiratory problems. And as a result, we have a limit. And the National Ambient Air Quality Standard requires that we maintain a minimum amount of NOx in the air. And if you do not meet it, or you have not attained that, you are considered a non-attainment area. And your state is then required to develop a state implementation plan to help correct that issue. The government is here to help. 70% of the NO2, the NOx that's generated, is from cars, trucks, planes, and other mobile sources and power plants. But when it comes to boilers and burners, other than power plant, coal-fired burners and gas-fired burners, only about 30% or less is coming from stationary burner boiler sources throughout the country. However, since they are stationary, it makes it a lot easier for the government to regulate what you can do. The other bad thing about NOx is that when it combines with volatile organics and heat um, and sunlight, it creates something called ozone. Okay, ground level ozone is a bad thing. Um, stratospheric ozone up in the atmosphere that's protecting us from the sun's harmful rays is a good thing. But in this case, when we have NOx, VOCs, and sunlight, we pr produce ozone, which again, ozone is another National Ambient Air Quality Standard Criteria Pollute. Now well, we've already talked about carbon monoxide, NOx, and ozone as being hazardous air pollutants that we all have to try and minimize to stay healthy. I'm gonna list some methods of controlling NOx, although I'm not gonna get into to all of them just because there are a number, there are literally dozens and dozens of ways people control NOx coming out of their boilers, but um, We'll talk about a few like induced flue gas recirculation. I mentioned that earlier. We literally take the relatively cool flue gases coming out of the boiler stack and reintroduce them into the flame, which reduces the overall flame temperature, thus reducing the thermal NOx, thus reducing the overall NOx produced. 
You also have internal flue gas recirculation. There's some burner designs out there that instead of having an induced pipe that's sucking gases from the stack, they actually internally recirculate the flue after in the combustion process. So very neat technology that's been developed over the years, and there are some very, very promising burner technologies out there today. It's just been developed in the last year or two that uh, that incorporate that type of technology. Stage combustion, by staging the air and the fuel, you can also control NOx production. Premix technologies, obviously by keeping the, uh, the flame temperature low, you're minimizing NOx production. Also, surface combustion technologies. Selective catalytic reduction. In some cases, we just can't reduce the NOx low enough without the help of scrubbing or introducing ammonia into a catalyst or urea into a catalyst on the back end of the combustion process. Selective catalytic reduction, used quite a bit. And um, I know California is, has been pretty successful in making that work. And uh, in many cases, SCR installations reduce NOx to one part per million or less. When you're burning fuel oil, you may want to use a low nitrogen bound fuel. You'll often find that your burner manufacturer is going to require a fuel analysis so that they can guarantee certain NOx requirements if you do have a low NOx application in your area. Using pure oxygen in lieu of air. If you're not in injecting nitrogen, which air is close to 80%, 78% nitrogen, then that will also reduce NOx formation. And there are many others, okay? Just wanted to mention a few of those to let you know they're there. Uh, if you have a burner that is a low NOx burner, I highly recommend that you get the operating and maintenance manual. You review the manufacturer's recommendations and requirements uh, prior to showing up on site, okay? So many of the messages just mentioned, many of the methods we just mentioned rely on keeping the flame temperature low in order to minimize the amount of thermal NOx formation in the combustion process. Been around for a while. So let's talk a little bit about combustion efficiency and how it's calculated, right? In order to calculate combustion efficiency, we need, we need a few things to happen. One, combustion has to be complete. Right? We need to be on the lean side, at least, of the curve. Uh, we need to know what the heating value of the fuel is. Typically, with your portable combustion analyzer, you're going to enter that, either gas or oil, number two oil, number four oil, number six oil. We need to know the net stack temperature. That's basically the difference between the combustion air going into the burner and the stack gases leaving, leaving the boiler. Okay? And your combustion analyzer should have both of those temperature measurements on board as well. And then we need to know the O2 percentage. Knowing the O2 percentage gives us all that we need to know then um, to calculate combustion efficiency. So the formula is simple. Even though it may not look simple here in a moment, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave you with a combustion efficiency calculator that you can download in the handouts, in the handout section of our presentation uh, webinar page. And um, it has an Excel spreadsheet that you just simply plug in the temperatures and the O2 values uh, in the fuel, and it will calculate combustion efficiency for you, right? So here's the efficiency calculation. 100 basically minus your stack loss. So what do we have here? We have CO2. That CO2 percentage is the maximum CO2 times 20.9 minus what your reading of oxygen is divided by 20.9. And here are your CO2 maxes for, CO, for natural gas, number two and number six oil. Here are your gas constants, which are really the heating value of the different fuels. And then you have your differential temperatures in degrees Celsius. Plug those in, and you can calculate combustion efficiency. So in the spreadsheet that I have attached, uh, if you want to play around with it a little bit, there's also a Celsius degree Fahrenheit to Celsius converter in the same spreadsheet that you can use if you're, if you're used to using Fahrenheit more than Celsius. And uh, But you do need to input the the values in degrees Celsius to get the proper combustion efficiency. So you notice right here for the, all the same stack temperatures and all the same combustion air temperatures and all the same O2 values, that natural gas burns less efficient than number two fuel oil and number two fuel oil burns less efficient than number six fuel oil. Let's talk about some typical heating values of fuel um, and they vary quite a bit based on region. It's important if you're doing 
a, an analysis or you're setting up a burner that you know what the BTU content is per cubic foot or per volume of fuel that you're burning. Natural gas can vary anywhere from 950 to 1150 BTUs per cubic foot. That's pretty significant when you're talking about input or heat input of a burner. That could be, you could be overfiring or underfiring by as much as you know, 10 to 15 percent. And just by not knowing the BTU content of that specific customer gas. Propane, typically around 2,500 BTUs per cubic foot. You have diesel, the number two fuel oil. It varies quite a bit as well. It can vary from 139,000 up to over 142,000 BTUs per gallon. And then LPG, typically in the 91,000 BTUs per gallon range. Net stack temperature. Net stack temperature is measured by taking the stack temperature minus the air inlet temperature. Okay, air inlet temperature or air can come either from the boiler room where the burner is installed or it can be ducted directly in to the burner from outside. Now, in the case where you're ducting air from outside, it's important that you have a way to measure combustion air temperature because it could vary quite a bit from your actual boiler room temperature. So what kind of things affect efficiency? Let's just talk about stack temperature. Okay? If you lower your stack temperature, if you're setting your combustion and your stack temperature lowers, it's gonna improve your efficiency. It makes sense because as you, as you, you'll become less efficient as the output increases and the stack temperatures rise, okay, as the internal boiler temperatures rise because you're taking more of that combusted gas and sending it out the stack at a hotter temperature. So obviously you're gonna start dropping in efficiency if you do that. So by, by measuring and monitoring your stack temperature on a daily basis, the you know, logs, it will definitely help you determine if your boiler is having issues with either combustion or scaling or fouling on the, the water side or even on the combustion side. Dew point. Dew point, very important that you take care not to put a non-condensing boiler into a condensing application. Right. Basically, that means you're going to drop. Don't let the stack temperature drop so low that you start condensing that H2O that's produced in the combustion process. That can literally cause significant corrosion to happen to the carbon steel and could cause your boiler actually to fail. For natural gas, and it, this could vary based on burner manufacturer, boiler manufacturer, but typically you don't want to go much less than 250 degrees. And then for number two fuel oil, um, about 275 degrees. Let's look at a condensing boiler. Just so, so in the case where you do have a condensing boiler, in this case where I have return water that's fairly cold, I'm actually heating up hot water to supply. Now condensing boilers are only hot water heated. You're not going to find a condensing boiler in a steam application um, unless you have a condensing economizer, which we'll talk a little bit about economizers here shortly. But in this case, we're burning fuel here, we're heating up water, and as the flue gases go to the condensing section of the boiler, the H2O gives up its latent heat of vaporization, drips down into a collection area to drain, and then the cool flue gases end up leading to some type of non-corrosive stack. Could be PVC, stainless steel, a lot of different things. So the latent heat of vaporization is recovered and can result in boiler efficiencies near 97 to 98%. If you look at that H2O, when we talked earlier, the H2O value itself, that has about 970 BTUs per pound in it. If you did not recover that heat, it simply would go out the stack and heat the environment. But by taking cold water, returning it, and recovering that latent heat of vaporization from the water, we can have much higher combustion, much higher boiler efficiencies as a result. So economizers, economizers are simply a way to, another way in a steam application to recover heat leaving the stack and putting it into the boiler feed water prior to feeding it to the boiler. Because the hotter the boiler feed water is, the less fuel we have to use to heat it up. Okay, so it can be used to preheat the incoming water to utilize heat that would normally be wasted through the stack. A dew point bypass is often fitted to ensure that if the stack temperature gets too low, we don't start condensing. So 
So as the stack temperature drops and drops, we end up opening the bypass, allowing hotter gases to bypass the economizer so that we do not hit uh, condensing application in a non-condensing boiler. Fuel savings, typically you save about 1% fuel for each 10 degree rise in boiler feed water temperatures. Again, it's typically steam only, but I've seen economizers save between four and 5% in excellent applications and as little as one to 2% in, in normal applications. But if you have a million dollar fuel bill and you save 3% of that or $30,000 a year, that could be considerable. Other things that can affect combustion efficiency are induced draft systems. Okay, using an induced draft system can help with efficiency as it will keep a constant draft at the stack and furnace pressure in the boiler. This helps keep turbulence consistent in the combustion process. It'll also reduce the natural draw on the boiler after shutdown. Overfire draft control systems they use in, um, can be used in lieu of or in addition to an induced draft system. And a draft damper can almost eliminate stack losses when the burner is shut off as it can be shut completely. Okay. Now, in parallel positioning systems, which we'll talk about here shortly, you can also close the air inlet damper on the burner to perform the same function. Turn down. Every burner has a minimum and maximum output. The difference between these is known as turn down and is usually expressed as a ratio. For example, if the minimum output is 100,000 BTUs per hour and the maximum is a million BTUs an hour, the turn down would be expressed is 10 to 1. Okay. Typical turn down is usually in the range of 2 to 1 to 10 to 1. Higher turn down can be achieved depending on the burner design and the control system utilized. We've found that premix systems have shown exceptional ability to turn down greater than 20 to 1 while maintaining high combustion efficiencies by using the combustion air blower to blend or mix the fuel and air. Here's a typical example of an LMB3 system by Siemens using a premix blower, gas inlet, and air inlet. This system has shown in certain boiler and burner applications to have turn downs in excess of 30 to 1. Okay. This is an example of premix and turn down. So, why do we really care about turn down? Well, the importance is pretty simple. If we can turn down lower, Okay, based on during low load conditions, we can keep the burner from cycling on and off. Pretty easy. If the lowest available firing rate results in too much output, it'll lead to cycling. Now, cycling is bad for a lot of reasons, other than you can end up wasting some heat. You can also excessively cycle your burner components, your blower motor starter, your solenoid valves, ignition transformers, etc. So it can extend the life of your burner as well as your boiler by reducing thermal stresses on the boiler, and at the same time, help you save money in the process. So let's talk about some of the combustion control systems that are out there. Single point control, linkage, back shaft, cam assembly. Been around forever, at least since I've been in this business. Um, we'll talk a little bit about those. We'll talk about linkageless or parallel positioning systems. Also been around for about half my career. And then fully metered and cross limited systems. So here's a typical picture of a linkage burner. Um, this manufacturer is no longer in business, but if you take a look close at the burner, you'll see a mod motor, linkage arms, a jack shaft, variable cams, fuel oil valve, and a gas butterfly valve. Okay, so linkage burners link air damper and the fuel valve together through a common linkage. They maintain a fixed relationship through the entire firing range. Okay, here's the mod motor, there's the oil cam, there's the gas cam. Unfortunately, linkage burners utilize a mechanical cam link arm to adjust the fuel ratio. Okay, been around for a long time. It um, has some downfalls to it because the position of the air in relation to the fuel is fixed throughout the entire firing range. Since a number of conditions can affect combustion from day to day or season to season, commissioning often results in the technician setting the burner up in a fuel lean condition, okay? That way he makes sure that the burner is operating on the right-hand side of the combustion curve or the stoichiometric position, okay? Combustion efficiency may be sacrificed as a result. 
wants to make sure he doesn't have to come back the next day because the burner is smoking. So he's going to make sure this burner is set up in a lean condition. So variations in ambient conditions don't result in that. There's also a lot of hysteresis that occurs from tolerances or slop present in the linkage mechanism. Okay, And that can vary uh, while modulating up or down in firing rate. So you may be at one specific combustion condition on the way up, but then it changes on the way down just due to hysteresis and slop in the mechanical mechanism. This can also affect your combustion efficiency. Okay. Let's talk about that mod motor, because typically in the past, those motors that, that were often used only had two switches, which meant that sometimes, say for instance, you had a five to one turn down burner in this case, but your ignition position could only happen at two million BTU. Okay, which is only two and a half to one turn down. So if you set your ignition position here at two million BTUs an hour, you've now limited your turn down because those are your only two positions. Low fire and ignition are the same. Okay, so oftentimes that 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 motor itself was the cause of some excessive cycling. Now, if you had a separate low fire ignition with multiple switches, it was a much better condition. So if you had an actuator that had a, a separate low fire position from the ignition position, then you could obtain that five to one turn now, right? While still having reliable ignition positions. This is also um, helps with dual fuel applications if I have multiple switches. So I can have independent ignition and low fire for both fuels that I'm burning. The independent ignition position is really important. With a linkage burner, sometimes a low fire position is dictated by where the burner can safely or reliably light off. If the burner has a compatible compatible modulating motor or is a linkageless system, the ignition position can be set differently from the low fire position and alleviate that concern. Let's talk a little bit about linkageless burner controls. Okay, linkageless burners allow the air and the fuel to each individually be controlled by an, its own actuator. You can have additional actuators for flue gas recirculation, sliding head, second fuel valve, et cetera, and can also be in, you know, those can also be incorporated into control scheme. This allows for true characterized combustion curve to the entire firing range. The real key in parallel positioning systems is the actuator. It's very important that the actuator is accurate and finds the required position every time with extreme accuracy for the combustion to match what was commissioned. Digital, in, our, in our case, digital CAN bus signals of high accuracy and safety. We have a 0.1 degree accuracy on this actuator. We have a digital feedback signal that ensures accurate positioning by using a non-contact hall effect sensor. The system continuously monitors the integrity of the CAN bus wiring. Actuators are daisy chained on a single cable to help minimize wiring installation. No calibration is required from the actuators. They are pre calibrated at the factory. Actuators are actually shipped in the zero position, but depending upon the address, they will automatically reposition themselves based upon the address in the LMB. Okay. Benefits of linkageless controls. Improve repeatability, reduce hysteresis associated with linkage arms, swivel joints, and other jack shaft components. Direct connection of individual actuators to fuel valve, air dampers, FGR dampers, et cetera. This enables the commissioning engineer to set up the burner to match the most efficient combustion settings of the burner. We also have a fuel to air ratio curves that are set electronically and give greater flexibility for adjustment when we have a low emission requirement. We also have a full proportional integral derivative control, which ensures accurate set point control, not just proportional, but proportional integral and derivative. We have a lower downtime as a result, mostly to improve diagnostics and improve troubleshooting. The faster you can diagnose and troubleshoot and fix your burner, the faster you're up back up and running. And the ability to utilize blower motor variable frequency drives and O2 trim modules. This helps reduce electrical power consumption and maximizes combustion efficiency, both of which reduce your carbon footprint. Then we have a fully metered cross-limited system where we literally measure the fuel flow and the air flow, and we match those up based upon the firing rate. We cross-limit to make sure the air is always leading on the way up and lagging on the way down. Some of the advantages of fully metered systems are 
Measuring the mass flow of air and fuel allows for accurate fuel to air ratio control because we're measuring pounds of air and pounds of fuel. Therefore, variations in fuel pressure or temperature and air pressure temperature are automatically compensated for so that the proper ratios are always maintained. It compensates for airflow restriction due to dirty air uh, fan blades, which happens quite often, plugged air inlet filters, etc. It'll automatically compensate for that regardless of what happens. Very accurate, very repeatable. Gives you the ability to utilize that same blower motor variable frequency drive and O2 trim system, thus reducing electrical power consumption and maximizing your combustion efficiency. It also allows for full ID control, as in the case of a parallel positioning system. Oh, the future, the LB6. This system is what we've been waiting for. We're still waiting for it. Just to give you a little Heads up on what it looks like. Um, performance, scalability, sustainability, reliability, plus the ability to do mass flow measurement and auto commissioning. A lot of really neat features coming forward in the LMB6. We're looking forward to bringing it here as soon as possible. But kind of close out this, um, important to look at the cost of that burner over its useful life. So here we had a burner, initial cost on the front end, we're going to assume that the burner lasts for 15 years. Then we have the installation cost, which might be as much as the burner, or maybe less. The setup cost, which hopefully is not as much as the burner cost. We have maintenance over the life of the burner. Probably have more maintenance cost involved than you have the initial burner cost. And then we have the real cost, and that's your fuel cost. That's your total cost to your customer, the fuel, which brings up the question. Do you want to say 10% of the burner cost or 10% of the fuel cost? In my, in my um, opinion, buying an efficient burner, including the controls that will maximize performance, is what you want to do on the front end. So if you spend an extra 10% on a burner or even 20% on the burner, but it saves you $200,000 over the life of the burner, well, it's paid for itself by, by buying the, uh, the, the burner with the best efficiency and the best control. Okay. So I'm a big believer in burner replacements and, and new burners because there are some really, really good um, combustion technology that's out in the field right now. And we're looking forward to having our control systems um, mounted on those burners and watching the system perform going forward. That said, I'm going to thank everybody for listening. I hope um, some of the basic things that I talked about today were useful to you. Uh, like I said I, I encourage you to uh, send us questions. Uh, and again, if you'd like to speak with us, just put your phone number in the question mark um, in the question box and we will um, give you a call back. We'll try and get back to all your questions within the next few days. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to contact your national account manager or your account manager for your specific area. We'd be more than happy to talk to you about um, things that we've got going on as a company. We'd love to have you come up to our training facility in Chicago if you get a chance. And um, that said, Again, thanks a lot. Everybody have a great week and um, stay safe.